So I teach, um, I teach in Red Burn Shop uh, down in New York at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU. And uh, one of our students there, uh, Jorge Juice, has introduced me to, can I get the slides? Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Some sort of video error, so we'll do this without slides. How fascinating. Yes, how fascinating. Uh, uh, <laughs> What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, introduce me to Josh Groban. Uh, Josh Groban is a singer of baritone, and uh, he sings a style of music called popra, which is pretty much what it sounds like. Uh, and he is sweet-voiced, uh, emotionally demonstrative, and cute, which is, as you might imagine, a winning combination. And so his legion of fans has been characterized to me by Jorge as teenage girls and their grandmothers. <coughs> Now, there's no radio station that, ca that caters to teenage girls and their grandmothers, right? So he couldn't have assembled that audience without word of mouth on his side, right? So he is a good old internet success story. He was able to reach these people, and then they reached out to one another and assembled themselves as a group of his fans. It's a great story, but it's one that's been told several times, and that's not the story I want to tell this morning. The story I want to tell this morning is what happened next. In 2002, one of his fans, uh, one of his intense fans, they call themselves the Grobanites, and they hang out on the Josh Groban fan boards on uh, joshgroban.com, said, let's get him something for his birthday. Right? He's about to turn 21. Let's get him a birthday present. Right? Now, this is a young man who, before he is legally allowed to drink beer, right, has fame, fortune, and the adulation of an unending string of teenage girls. What could he possibly want? What do you get for the man who has everything? <clears throat> so they say, let's, let's make a charitable donation in his name. Right? We'll pass the hat. Everybody kick in a little bit. We'll write a check you know, to, some, to some charity. $75,000 later, they write a check to the David Foster Foundation that works with disadvantaged youth. And the women who've suddenly created this ad hoc philanthropy network realize, hey, we're on to something here. We're actually pretty good at this. So then they go to Groban and they say, you know what, we'd like to raise more money. Right? We, we, we like each other. This generous, this generous action seems good. How can we work together? And Josh Groban's lawyers very quietly start freaking out because the fans want to give us money, which is kind of what we're in the business to do, but it's not for profit, but we're not a not for profit, so if we take the money, there's tax implications, right? It's very complicated. And if you read the house organs of the philanthropy world, Chronicle of Philanthropy, Philanthropy World Magazine, <clears throat> there are not a lot of articles on, here's what you do when a group of people spontaneously self-assemble and then suddenly generate money, <laughs> right? Because it hasn't really been a big problem heretofore. <laughs> so the lawyers, Groban's lawyers, get together and they, they start a 501c3, a not-for-profit corporation called the Josh Groban Foundation. And essentially all they're doing is quickly building a bowl to catch the money falling from the sky. Right? And then on, on they go, right? raising money, dispersing funds, raising money, dispersing funds. And then a really funny thing happens. Right? The Grobanites, right, the women who are actually doing the charitable donation, realize the Josh Groban Foundation isn't actually any good at raising money. We're the ones raising the money. Right? They're just an interface so that the money can pass from us to them to these charities. So they start their own 501c3, their own non-for-profit called Grobanites for Charity. Right? And Grobanites for Charity's sole mission is to raise the money and work with the Josh Groban Foundation to figure out where the money should go. So it's actually two nonprofits operating in sort of two halves of a kind of colony creature almost. Grobanites for charity, 100% of the donations go to the recipients. Right? The entire thing is run like a volunteer effort. Right? The Josh Groban Foundation doesn't even have its own site. They just have an RSS feed underneath joshgroban.com. And if you go there, right, you'll see, oh, we're doing a holiday drive. Here's the link or whatever. It's all very sort of standard. It's a press release under a sort of standard, well-designed institutional homepage. You go to Grobanites for charity, it looks like 1996 threw up. 
right? It's those cute colored hearts. There's lots of little tabs that are all different colors because everybody's like, hey, there's fonts in here, right? <laughs> and <clears throat> right? It, it looks like it was done by amateurs. And the reason is it was done by amateurs, right? Not just in the sense of not professional, but also in the sense of people who do things for the love of it, right? And the entire front page of Grobenites for Charity is basically shout outs, right? We want to thank all of these people for doing these great things. It reads like a church circular, right? We want to thank Julie Clark for whipping up some sweet potato pie, right? <laughs> Except it's we want to thank Julie Clark for whipping up a global institution out of thin air, right? Now we're used to prepending to the phrase global institution, big comma professional comma, a big professional global institution. What we've now got is a small amateur global institution, right? There was a subset of Grobenites for Charity called Grobenites for Africa, and their sole purpose is to research and interface with recipients of their funds uh, in African charities going from the Grobenites. In fact, they just made a $40,000 donation to the Siawela Fund, in, or the, the Siawela organization in South Africa that, that uh, works with AIDS orphans, right? Grobenites for Africa is a wholly unowned subsidiary of Grobenites for Charity, also 100% donated, right? And yet, right, there's no big philanthropic infrastructure anywhere. They've done things in the opposite order from, say, the Sierra Club, where you get together and you raise money, and only, or you get together and you get a budget, and only then do you start doing direct mail pieces and getting members and raising money. These guys started with the members before they even had a mission, and then they had the money before they had an institution. Right? It reverses everything we're used to about philanthropy. So why, why would the Grobenites for Charity separate themselves once the Josh Groban Foundation existed? Why would they separate themselves into a different institution? Right. One of the answers is motivation. Right. There's a psychologist, Edward Desi, who works on human motivation. And probably his most famous experiment involved these uh, uh, sort of a puzzle game called Soma. It's these cubes that un unassemble and reassemble. You can turn them into a big cube, but you can also make other kinds of shapes with them. And he took one group of students, and he would bring them one at a time into a room and say, Here, here's this game, here's this Soma game, and here's sort of a list of, uh, a map of shapes you can make. We just want to see what you do with it. And then the students would sort of assemble the shapes. Another stream of students he had come through, identical in every respect, here's a Soma game, here's the list of shapes, except he would say, we'll pay you for every one of these shapes you can make. Right? That wasn't the experiment, although the students thought it was. At the end of each of these periods, he would say, oh, I, I just got to go enter some data in the computer. I'll be back in a sec. And he would leave the room for exactly eight minutes. And they would watch the students through a one-way mirror. The students who had been invited to play with the cubes kept playing with them. Like, oh, what can I do? Maybe I could do this. How would this work? Right. The students who had been paid, the minute the researcher was out of the room, <laughs> leafing through the New Yorker, looking out the window, completely uninterested. Right? Some kinds of motivation can actually kill other kinds of motivation. And what I think the Grobenites for Charity, Josh Groban Foundation has, has found is that separating the professional and amateur pieces of this effort is a better way of designing for generosity than the ways we're used to. Now, designing for generosity is something we all know how to do sort of natively, right? If you've ever had a dinner party, right, you understand how this works. I promise to provision the food. If it's me, I promise to clean up the house a little, right? You come over, other people come over, and through some miracle of aggregation, we all have a better time than if we just sat at home, each of us by ourselves, eating dinner. It's easy to see how to design for generosity when you're working at a small scale, starting with people you know. It's harder to see how to design for generosity working at a large scale, starting with people you don't know and people who don't know each other. That is new. In fact, it's so new that I think I can put a date on the moment when the conversation became general. The date is 1999 with the launch of Napster. Right. Napster was the first peer-to-peer -peer file sharing program for music. The idea was that Napster would index all of the world's hard drives to find uh, available MP3s, available music files. Uh, and then let the users get them from one another. So if you awake at a cold sweat four in the morning thinking, I must have a copy of Golden Earrings Radar Love, 
right? And if I'm awake at four in the morning, or more to the point if my computer is awake at four in the morning, you can get it from me. Knock yourself out, no charge. To say that this was a popular offering would be a gross understatement. Napster was the fastest growing piece of software in history. More than 70 million users in less than 18 months. Right? And it's the first time that I remember people who never thought about technology suddenly groping for some explanation as to what was happening and why. And Two explanations were offered. The first explanation, the explanation that's always offered whenever anything interesting happens on the internet is, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, <laughs> right? Kids today lack any ethical compass. They've all just become criminals, right? The second explanation put forward is we're entering an age of digital Krishna consciousness in which <laughs> generosity is just flowing as a result of, right? Now, it's obvious that both of these explanations can't be right, but what's less obvious is that neither of them is right. That, in fact, the first explanation, kids are criminals, is an attempt to explain why people are so willing to take, and the second explanation, digital Krishna consciousness, is an attempt to explain why people are so willing to give. But neither of those explanations actually covers the whole transaction. Here's what actually happened. Digital data means that if you have a computer, you can create a new copy of that data that is perfect in every way at zero cost. You buy the computer, the copies are free. Right? And B, people are willing to be generous, but only within certain limits. And they respond to incentives. So you can make people be less or more generous by making it harder or easier to be generous. And you can make people less or more generous by making generosity either less or more valuable. And C, Sean Fanning, the designer of Napster, linked A with B by making a system that made it easy to be generous and made the payoff for being generous much higher. That's it, that's what happened. Now if that sounds a little boring, well it is a little boring, right? It's certainly not as fun as saying the world is going to hell in a handbasket. But that's what Fanning did. He linked new capabilities with old motivations through good design. That's, that's what designing for generosity means. So there's another example, another community that I've spent some time following. Um, I love these guys, Howard Forums. Right? Howard Forums is Howard Forums for the same reason that Craigslist is Craigslist. It was started by Howard Chu. He's a self-described self, uh, cell phone geek, lives in Toronto. Several years ago, he buys a phone. Right? He plums the depth of every menu, writes down what he sees, and he starts blogging about it. And this is at a time when not that many people were blogging, and certainly not that many people were blogging with cell phones. So people started coming by, reading his stuff, like, oh, this guy's an expert. I'll ask him my question, right? What do you do with a Samsung? He doesn't know, he's only got one kind of phone, right? He's only got one kind of carrier. He doesn't even live in the US, he's in Canada. And so in a, in a gesture that was one part genius to one part exasperation, he said, I, I don't have time and I don't know the answers. Like, you people talk to each other. And he puts up a bulletin board and connects it to his blog, right? And they've started talking to each other, right? On Howard Forums, there is a collection of subjects for every handset manufacturer, and a, an individual subject for every handset, every kind of phone, and then there are sub-discussions for individual features of individual phones. Right? One for every carrier, including different kinds of service plans, data and voice, conversations for different countries. The technical conversation on Howard Forums has gotten so good that engineers at either phone manufacturers or carriers will sometimes refer questions to Howard Forums. Which seems really crazy, right? What do the amateurs have access to that the professionals don't? And the answer is the amateurs have access to reality, right? <laughs> We're the only ones that have access to reality. In theory, every phone works fine with every carry. In practice, not so much, right? right? And if I'm taking my, my Samsung phone and I'm moving from T-Mobile to AT&T, well, the T-Mobile and AT&T engineers aren't even allowed to talk to each other, right? The only people who've been through what we've been through are the other customers. And this is the second thing that Howard Forms, the people on Howard Forms have access to. So we have access to each other. If I've got part of the answer and you've got part of the answer, together we can create a better answer than someone who's sitting inside a company trying to model what the world should be like can possibly say. In fact, just the other day, just the other day, three months ago, uh, I answered a question, right? I finally found the answer to a question about a cell phone that wasn't yet on Howard Forms. I felt like I was on Family Feud, like, oh, I know the answer, I know the answer, right? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a really geeky answer, I'm not gonna explain it here, but it was a really good answer. 
And I felt this wave of relief, effectively, and also pride, like I'd done a really interesting thing. And I'd been able to give back to the community that I've been benef benefiting from for so long. And when you see on Howard Forms what people are willing to do for one another, there's this, there's this thread on putting ringtones on a Samsung T509, right? Pretty narrow. So you see those kinds of conversations, and you think, it's nice those people have something to do with their Saturday nights, right? But how, how general is this, right? In this year, Howard Forums will do about one B is for billion page views. Ad-supported site, staff of two, billion page views, right? What Chris was talking about, the overflow, the, the, what economists call the positive externality, the additional value, right? When people on Howard Forums are answering questions for one another, they're also creating value for us. If you get an error message on your phone and you type it into a browser, there's a pretty good chance that one of the first links that comes back is going to be to somebody on Howard Forums who's answered your question. And they really answer these questions. They answer them to a fairly well. This Samsung T509 ringtone thing, it's not just, oh, here's some instructions. It is page by page screenshots, right? It runs this long in your browser, really detailed. No contract. This wasn't this person's job, Mr. Fan, who'd done this thing. Um, in writing it out, he was very careful to say, I'm doing this for this phone, but I've actually taken some material from Dan Vuok, who was another user, right? There's a, big, there's a big premium on the reputation economy because that's what's keeping this going. And the entire thing is incredibly detailed and useful. Right? It's not all like that on Heron Forms. There are some, there are some uh, uh, sort of misc conversations. Right? There's one that's, show us pictures of your pets, right? So you can go in there, right? If, if, should you need any pictures of cute cats and not be able to find them anywhere else on the internet, right? <laughs> Howard Forums, right? You, you, you got the hookup, right? And anybody with any business sense can go in and look at this and say, well, you've got this document over here, right? This, this T509 thing. And then you've got this picture of a gray cat over here that's kind of cute. Like, it's easy to see how to make Howard Forums more valuable. Just get rid of the cat and double down double down on the screenshots. But that misunderstands what's going on because Howard Forums isn't a business, right? The screenshots and the pictures of the cats, which look different from a utilitarian mindset, this useful, that not, are actually all coming from the same motivation, which is users who know each other saying, here, I've got something I want to show you. I think you might like it. People are doing this, screenshotting, in spite of that, the cat. They're doing this because of that. And they're doing that because of this, right? It's part of the community that's keeping the whole thing up in the air. Psychologists who study motivation group human motivation into, into two broad categories, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic motivations are pretty much the ones you expect, fame, fortune, and great physical beauty. Or, barring that, a really nice pair of shoes. Anything that makes you outwardly more attractive. Right? There's also intrinsic motivations. In particular, the desire to be competent, to feel like you're in ethical alignment with your environment, and to be loved or appreciated. And it seems to me that at least part of what's happened is that we've been willing to buy or at least tolerate in our public discourse the idea that the extrinsic motivations are motivations, that that's essentially what drives people. Just, just yesterday, I'm up the street having a cup of coffee, and I get a call from a New York Times reporter who's doing a story on these groups of bloggers who, because they're all in the same city, are getting together and having these kind of impromptu salons. And the reason he's called me right, is he wants to talk to someone who may be able to answer a question for him. Why would they be doing this? <laughs> right? It's not work. They're not getting dates out of it. Why on earth would people get together to be in one another's company? I hardly knew where to start. <laughs> right? it's, and this, in a way, is, I think, why the, things like Grobenites for Charity or the generosity of the Howard Forums users for one another is such a surprise to us. Right? Some of it right, is that it's just a set of technical surprises. Right? We can now operate at a very large scale with very low thresholds to entry. So we can do things at internet scale. We can do things at population scale. But increasingly, it seems to me that it's not just the technology here that's making these things surprising. We're also surprised because we've just forgotten 
about intrinsic motivations. Right? We've forgotten that people have all sorts of reasons to do things that don't have to do with fame and fortune, that don't have to do with the idea that it's better to look good than to feel good. So now's the part of the talk where I give you the recipe. I tell you essentially how to do this, how to design for generosity in such a way as to create these effects. I'm running out of time, unfortunately, so I can't, uh, no, I, I don't know. The answer, is, the answer is there is no recipe. There's no recipe in part because we're still in the world of special cases, right? We're still in a world where it's just onesies and twosies, and oh my goodness, look at this weird thing over here, right? But it's also because the users always get a vote, right? And even if you do everything right, sometimes the users just say no. So there's no obvious and automatic way to make this stuff work, to make this be successful. But we do know a few really critical things. Right? The first is design for intrinsic motivation. Right? Design an environment in which people can feel good at what they're doing, they can feel like they're doing the right thing vis-a-vis -vis their fellow citizens, uh, where they can be appreciated, right? and they will flock to you. Right? Critically, and, and a lot of sites don't understand this, Love and fame are not on the same dial. Right? It's easy to think, oh, fame is just love turned up. More people love me. Yeah, but more people love you less, and they don't really know you. Right? Being appreciated by a small number of people who know you well is a different kind of emotion than being appreciated by a large group of people who don't know you well. Right? And so everybody who says, come, on, you know, come here, come participate, and you'll get famous, may think that they're appealing to intrinsic motivations, but they're actually not. Right? The people on Howard Forums, they're doing it for each other. We're along for the ride. We're getting all of this value by being able to look for these error messages, but they're in it, they're in it for each other. The second thing, autonomy is so essential. Right? We all know what generosity without autonomy sounds like. It sounds like an NPR fund drive. Right? Right? The reason the Grobenites for charity, even after the foundation of a real 501c3, started their own, was that it was their idea. They're the ones doing the fundraising, and it was a way of insisting on their autonomy, even as they were participating in a larger system. And the final thing, right, in a way the hardest thing, right, everybody understands that closing down a system, locking it down, trying to control it completely will kill this kind of generosity. What's less well understood, but is I think equally important, is if you make a system completely open and completely freeform, it will also kill generosity. Because everything will get dissipated or people will wander off or the trolls will come in and set up shop. Right? The Howard Forums people share pictures of their cats. But they don't share recipes, and they don't, they don't spend a lot of time advertising. In fact, people who come on, on the site and start advertising are actually roundly criticized. There are real limits, even within cultures that have a high degree of respect for one another. Try something, we'll see if it's interesting. Right? And designing systems that have the right mix of freedom and constraints, very often constraints enforced on the users by one another, uh, is really the art. And the head shift, the head shift behind all of this is viewing people not as just an aggregated bag of individual motivations, but thinking of us as participants in social systems, and assuming that those systems have an internal logic that matters and can be analyzed on its own, separate from just the aggregate roll-up of the individuals. Because once you switch to that, that view of the world, I think really incredible things can start happening. Thank you very much. <laughs>